Good morning. I'll try to get through the presentation as quickly as possible so we can get over to the case. Next slide, please. So this is a 73-year-old female with a history of end-stage liver disease secondary to Bud Chiari syndrome. Uh, back in 98, she actually got the first living unrelated liver transplant that was done at Sinai's transplant program, Go Sinai Transplant. In 2004, she had the juxtarenal AAA, the details of which are not really clear. It was done at an outside hospital. They had to put in bilateral renal snorkels and then put in a talent device, a tube device rather than a bifurcated device to repair that uh, AAA at that time. The reason for that, I'm not really sure. 2013, uh, she occluded both of her renal snorkels and her liver that she had transplanted ultimately failed, so she ended up getting both a liver and a kidney transplant at that time. And now, this time around, she presented with worsening abdominal and back pain, about three to five days duration, getting worse uh, by the day. You can see some of her past medical history there. Uh, on presentation to us, she was afebrile, normal tensor, but was significantly tachycardic with some tenderness to palpation in the left upper quadrant. Uh, sorry, right upper quadrant, as well as having some back pain. Labs were unremarkable at that time with the normal white count. The culture since then have been negative for any kind of infection. Next slide, please. And you can kind of, if you can flip through these slides a bit, these are some coronal reconstructions. Up on the right side, you see a big pseudoaneurysm that's coming off what we presume to be a ligated kind of branch, uh, ligated graft uh, from the first actual uh, liver transplant. And then you see a bilobed aneurysm. You see bilateral snorkels that are in place into the renals. Uh, if you can flip back a little bit more, please. There's no contrast that we can see filling in through the bilateral snorkels, so they are down. Uh, and then you have this bilobed aneurysm that's juxtarenal and then right above the aortic bifurcation as well. Uh, what you are starting to glimpse a little bit at the iliacs there is that there's significant calcification at the iliac vessels as well, uh, making access a challenging problem. So the two areas that we wanted to treat were the pseudoaneurysm as well as addressing the uh, infrarenal aneurysm that had grown in size since the last time that we had seen her. Uh, on the left of the screen, you can see where these, that we have cannulated the celiac axis and you're seeing a, uh, where the pseudoaneurysm leak is coming from. That was coil embolized on two separate occasions uh, and uh, plug-assisted glued as well to get complete stasis of flow. And on the right side of the screen, you see the bilobed aneurysm, one right up by the renal snorkels and one above the aortic bifurcation. Next slide. And this is really why the, ch the case was so challenging. On the left side of the screen, you could see terrible external iliacs that looks like just absolute disaster, which we needed to crack and pave in order to get our actual bifurcated device in. For this patient, we ended up putting a met uh, Medtronic Endurant device in. And on the uh, right side of the screen, you can see that off the left external iliac, you see the uh, current working functioning liver uh, kidney transplant. And now, despite having put up a proximal cuff all the way up to the level of the SMA, the right uh, image on the right side still shows this filling of the first lobe of the aneurysm. So the, the one that was right by the bifurcation seems like excluded, but we still have an endo leak that's coming in from the top, uh, presumably around the gutters where the renal snorkels are, and to fill that proximal portion of the endo leak. So now when we talked about <coughs> treatment options, uh, we kind of went over some of these together, uh, and the options were do nothing, but this patient had a growth of an aneurysm to a maximum of seven centimeters in diameter. That's at the infrarenal portion, and the juxtarenal portion had grown to grow greater than five as well, so high risk of rupture, so we didn't think that was a viable option. Open repair, this is a sick patient with multiple comorbidities, never a good thing. The second aneurysm above the bifurcation is excluded. Uh, we don't see any feeling of, uh, filling of that anymore. So we really felt that the aneurysm that we had to treat was a juxtarenal one, and we felt that this was coming from a gutter leak, so uh, the decision was made to go ahead and proceed with the embolization of the gutter from above, which uh, we'll be picking up from here. I'm just going to show you where we are and hopefully drive the conversation to a more uh, pointed uh, uh, place. So here you can see, uh, again, is our standard approach. We have a six-fence uh, slender sheath in the left wrist. This is, uh, again, a seroradial catheter going down the descending uh, aorta. We were able to torque it across the arch. You can see it's a fairly diseased arch, but we were able to navigate the sera down to the descending aorta. Next image, please. Obviously, the seroradial is tracking down to the uh, visceral aorta. Next image, please. Here, we're, we were actually able, and again, I think this is uh, to, I believe, uh, Marcello's point earlier on the previous case, the, the really wide reverse curve of the SERA allowed us to engage this gutter uh, fairly readily. And so this is just a, a cine run, and the, there's so many remarkable things about this, I'm just gonna start to talk about them freely. One is that the gutter um, obviously is, is real, uh, and it's related to this previous renal snorkel. Number two, it appears that the gutter is filling the renal artery. 
um, which is obviously not a functioning organ right now because there's a kidney transplant. The other thing is it's obviously filling a, a very robust retroperitoneal um, network, uh, which is going down into several lumbar arteries, uh, you know, down uh, the, the uh, patient's back. Uh, it's a very, very complex thing. We were able, uh, very lucky, this was moderately challenging to get a 018 wire and a microcatheter. Uh, you can see we're sort of struggling here because of all the markers on these cuffs and devices to even sneak an 021 microcatheter. Next image, please. And finally, uh, the uh, uh, microcatheter was able to sneak down. There it goes. It popped right into the gutter, and we have it looped down. Next image, please. And here's an injection from inside the gutter. And you can see the whole gutter and the left kidney fills well before the abdominal aortic aneurysm filled. So our setup right now, and I'm sure everyone is, you know, sort of, again, spinning their, their heads about what to do at this point, but we have a five French diagnostic catheter in the gutter. We have an 021 microcatheter in this, I, I guess I'm going to call it a, a, a you know, proximal type 1 leak, almost with the morphology of a pseudoaneurysm, which is filling a non-functioning organ. So I'm just going to repeat the plan here. We're going to put in, you know, two or three what I would call almost framing coils to create a, a skeleton within this gutter, and then we'll switch over to a liquid agent to minimize mm -hmm. the risk of it uh, migrating in an uncontrollable way. Does, does that sound reasonable? Phenomenal. Yeah. You can see it's pulsatile, and we're uh, right now administering uh, Onyx 34, exactly as you guys said, to try and minimize it uh, refluxing. That's the end of the first CC. So you can see here, we're sort of casting out the whole space here. And uh, we're just increasing the density. There's clearly a, a little bit more onyx tracking up towards that renal stent. Yep. Yeah, and interestingly, actually, you can see some of the onyx tracking to the right uh, pseudoaneurysm there, the right pair of renal aneurysm. And now we're a little bit in that renal stent, too. We can see some of the onyx uh, going... Moving medially here. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And it's almost pulsating up towards that renal. You see that? Mm -hmm. yes. At about 1 o'clock. We can see very well. Yep. And interestingly, you notice that there's much less pulsatility to the coil mass now. Good point. So I use that as a surrogate typically for these kinds of cases, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially when you either need to use a, a liquid assist embolization. If you can stop the pulsatility in your coil mass, that's probably a good time to think about stopping because mm -hmm. you probably achieve the goal that you set out for. So this is a, a different view here. And yeah. it's really yeah. right up to the fabric edge. I mean, it is, it is sitting right up there. And that was the last, you know, 0.1 cc I injected. So unless anybody disagrees, I'm going to lose access at this point. So what we typically do is we will, we will aspirate on the microcatheter just to reduce any redundancy uh, that we have here. Uh, and then we uh, very slowly but methodically retract the microcatheter. And you can see I'm not getting any resistance whatsoever here. So it slipped out very nicely. I hope everybody saw that. Yeah. The, the concern is when you're well embedded into a, a massive onyx is that the tip of the microcatheter can become embedded. Uh, the key thing there is not to apply more force, but just constant low levels of force and allow it to, to slide loose. We're doing one last angiogram here. Unfortunately, patient's too sedated for a breath hold, but... Uh, Celestino, can you show us the last, uh, the, uh, the third to f uh, last run? Looks like it had an excellent result. So this is a flush aortogram. You can see that that gutter leak is completely sealed. What's also interesting is we are no longer seeing that uh, leak that extended into the uh, perirenal aorta on the right. 